All right, it's uh, Benjamin Ray here with Tread Global, and I'm here with James Williams from the Cannabis Manufacturers Guild. How are you doing today? Good. How are you, Ben? Doing great, doing great. You know, we had our conversation last week where we explored sustainable packaging and really trying to reduce packaging waste. And I wanted to get back in into that a little bit more by diving a little deeper. But first, why don't you give some people a little bit of your background and what your company is about if they don't know you already? Sure, sure. Yeah. So my uh, my early days out of school was in uh, in finance, um, sales, investment banking, trading. Uh, I moved to a company called WeedMD here in Canada, where I ran business development and capital markets. I did that for about a year uh, in 2019, uh, just kind of as the legal market was expanding in Canada. And then uh, early this year in January, uh, I left with a few colleagues and we created Cannabis Manufacturers Guild. Um, the intent of the organization is to be a fully faceted solutions company for the uh, for the country uh, on anything cannabis. So we have a number of different um, groups we work under. So there's a trading business where we move biomass and oil around the market, uh, as well as equipment and contract manufacturing agreements. We have an advisory business who uh, advises companies on M&A, uh, CCAA processes, restructurings. Uh, we also have an agency business that builds brands for the market, uh, as well as CMG's own brands, uh, which will have about a dozen coming to market likely in 2021, we hope. And then um, we have a, a services platform, which takes a number of different groups across insurance, telemarketing, legal, uh, and we basically funnel in business development leads or sales leads uh, for these services to the rest of the industry. So we really, you know, wrap around the 500 or so cannabis LPs in Canada. Uh, we walk into most management teams and try to offer full white glove service. So if they have issues in, you know, costing and pricing, if they have equipment issues, uh, we try to just solve problems for the industry. And, uh, and so far it's been doing quite well. There's a lot of problems obviously in cannabis, but, uh, you know, glad it's been uh, well received year to date and looking forward to 2021. How have you decided to to have those different groups work together? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because I mean, I think you know, no one's uh, oblivious to the fact that you know there was a big bubble, uh, especially in Canada, and these cannabis companies a lot were overbuilt. Um, there's just a lot of very good talent uh, who came out of that first wave, uh, and really, we try to empower our teammates to to run their own businesses. We have our own line of consultants who mm -hmm. sit under our umbrella organization. It's their business, right? We just try to be that funnel for business development leads um, and just communication between the senior management teams of these large LPs. So when we have a trading business, there's a separate group who runs that, but they can cross funnel deals and information back to our agency business. So if we are gonna sell top grade flower to a client, well, we can also build a top uh, flower brand per se. Hmm. Or if we wanna do a new, um, beverage line with one of our partners, well, we have a number of brands or, or companies who want to partner with that. So, you know, there's multi steps that require to launch a product in this market. I think anyone who got into cannabis, you know, just thought it was, hey, CPG, let's just sell it. But there's so many nuances and regulatory hurdles and just different players. No one can do everything. No one's going to be vertically integrated for some time. Um, and that's where, you know, CMG steps up and we try to give a lot of the lower end LPs the same amount of buy-in power that you know the big canopies and auroras of the world have just through cross relationships so mm. yeah when there's one problem there's, there's typically a few more and mm. that's why we silo our different organizations so that uh if there's a problem we can solve you know that's great solving problems it's kind of 2.0 you know yeah. it's not just throw everything in it's kind of like okay now how are we going to move forward responsibly compliantly and, and help a lot of people yeah and that's that's why we met right i mean you yeah. know we had a lot of good conversations about you know where the industry is right now and where it should be, um, and through that there's there's problems. So so solving it's been uh, been very fun. It's we're obviously meeting a great, great deal of good people, and I think this you know call it second wave of legal cannabis is going to be less of trying to figure out you know how to sell what you've been left with and try to actually build products for consumers that they care about and can relate to. Great, cool. All right. So I want to go back to the conversation that we had the other day and expand on that a little bit more. And one of the themes that came out of that talk was the kind of disruption. And my position really is that to be truly disruptive in with sustainable packaging, it has to be way less expensive than the current options or the mainstream isn't really going to jump on it. And certainly if it's more expensive, it's not going to happen. So a point that you brought up was 
the difficulty in brands trying to sell higher price points and more, where with sustainability, the thought is it's a lower price point and less, obviously, sustainability. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and try to, you know, let's talk about possible ways to bring those two together? Yeah, and, and I think it's important to kind of back up why why we're really here, right? I mean, again, to our last conversation, um, you know, everyone was really on the back of their heels trying to move product that, you know, there's only a fixed number of buyers in Canada. So all the provincial buyers, you know, they really set the tone for what is going to feed through the channel. So if they tell you, you know, all this flour in the market's two dollars too high, well, you're gonna to have to penny pinch across your supply chain and figure out how cost savings. It really limits you and limits the operation managers from going in and saying, well, you know, this is a better, more sustainable product for the world, but it's going to cost me an extra two cents. So when you look at the next wave of products that need to come through and a lot of these you know, packaging manufacturers, it can't be an argument that, well, it's sustainable and the consumer cares. You know, to your point, the consumer may care, but they're only willing to pay so much for okay. it. They have to go kind of hand in hand. And you also have to have the mindset that, you know, we're all, we all answer to someone. Right. I mean, there's a lot of bureaucracy in the cannabis space, surprising how, how you know infinite may be. Um, it's very hard to make changes when it's going to add cost to everyone's bottle line without a very clear understanding if that's actually going to trigger any more increase in demand. Hmm. So when you look at solutions and how the industry should go, to your point, you want to be able to both marry a new innovative idea that also is cost beneficial, that also has a low barrier of switching difficulty so that you're really handing a full solution to a company that it makes it a no-brainer for them. And mm -hmm. if you do more of these no-brainer type solutions, adoption goes a lot higher. There's enough competition in this market that if we walk a solution from you know one street to the other, there's gonna be someone who's gonna wanna pick it up. And you will be able to find these interesting people within the organization who actually do care and do share the same opinion on some of these you know core issues like sustainability um now whether they can run it up the entire line and that you know story and narrative continues to build it's difficult but that's why you really have to have a full shotgun approach come up with something truly re revolutionary that if, if you get 10 percent adoption it leaves everyone catching up to you and, and that's where i see the most successful products originating so in terms of the supply chain then can you talk a little bit about that about you know, where it can be affected along there so that it can work, you know, all the way through. Yeah, I mean, the the tough part, at least when I look in Canada, um, is that a lot of that margin is going into intermediaries and regulatory systems, right? I mean, the provinces are taking very large rips to be a, to be a middleman. Um, and they also control the pipeline of what products get into the retail channels. So, you know, on one hand, you need to impress them. Um, and almost show them a product that they're going to want to buy. But you almost need to do it in a way that is leading your manufacturing changes so you know you're not going to install a $10 million piece of equipment that all of a sudden there's no demand for. And that's what I think a lot of the original issues in this industry came about. It was a lot of, if you build it, people will buy it. But we found out that's, that's certainly not the case in this industry. Um, and I don't think that's going to be the case in any of the, uh, the cannabis markets across the world. So you have to be a lot more tactful when you are launching a product where there's a little bit more feedback and discovery and understanding, okay, well, if I make this slight modification, will it change? So we believe highly in, in scaling small orders. So you know, there's been a few products we're working on. One in particular actually is a new gummy line um, so what's different about it is rather, if you look at most gummy building methodologies, um, you know, you basically make your formulation, put it in a tray, put it in the oven, comes out, you take it out, you coat it, and then you take it to a, a third party manu or, um, a packaging manufacturer to, to package into its final product. What we're launching is actually a product that that injects into its mold and its mold is its container, similar to like a pack of gum, so blister pack. So now all of a sudden, there's less people touching it, there's less chance of contamination, there's less packaging involved because rather than going and buying a mold, my mold is my packaging. So now you're saving $150,000 on running a bunch of different molds and you're not making platinum molds across the industry. So that in itself is a sustainable effort and it's also a cost advantage. So we'll be able to launch gummies into the market at a fractional white label cost to the rest of the industry only because that type of innovation went into it. 
Now, again, we want to start very small. We're going to drop one line into one um, area of the country, in Ontario specifically, uh, where there's obviously the, the largest market right now. Um, and you trial and error, right? There's 28 different formulations we have to choose from. Not everyone's going to be liked by the market, but you can make tweaks on, on the increments. So we'll have an organic gummy. We'll have a pectin gummy. We'll have one that's full spectrum. Um, and then you can start to scale up from that. But I think the original mindset that, hey, I'm going to drop 100 of these lines in which to dominate the market, it's, it's not going to work anymore. So that's just an example of one of the supply chain tweaks that, that we're doing in a particular category, but it can do it across all the categories. I mean, so we're you're, all you're thinking that if you if you're able to take a little bit out along the supply chain, either time or money or capital expense, then that is going to make it cost less overall to the organization, not necessarily just that the package is less expensive. Yeah, because it, it goes hand in hand. I mean, there's a reason that a lot of these gummy manufacturers have 50 people packing gummies. That's a lot of labor, right? If you go to traditional Hershey's factories, they're a lot more automated. Now, again, no one wants to buy fully automated technology. However, the market's changed again, where in Canada, you have 50% underutilization of licensed facilities these days. There's a lot of open space with a lot of people who don't know how to tech properly monetize it. So CMG, we tend to build partnerships where, you know, we'll bring the line in, we'll bring the CapEx and the OpEx, you bring the facility and together we'll launch a product and collaboration. Those are the deals we're seeing a little bit more often. And again, if you do have these innovators who are going out there and, and typically the people who are, you know, innovating on their own dime or don't have a lot of capital market support, it's very important to so it's very important to um, to partner these groups together and, and ensure that you know you're driving everything along the same lines we we just had a comment here um, that I that I put up here which is kind of interesting and you know if you could respond to this um, you know when we we're talking about sustainability and that was kind of the point there that it may not be the package but it is across the whole value chain or supply chain so if you could respond to this that might help yeah, so I, I, I mean, you're right. It doesn't necessarily mean lower price, but it's a worthwhile to objective to do both. If you can accomplish both, then you have a winning product. It's just a lot more difficult as, as again, we're a, a very heavy sales based institution. If, if I walk into a company and say, look, you're gonna have to pay an extra two cents for this widget and it's gonna be sustainable though, um, typically getting through to the next level of management is gonna be a lot more difficult. If you can challenge both in tandem, then you have a winning solution. And, and you yeah, know, it's, it's not inherently true on both sides, but I think the more successful companies who tackle both um, will be, you know, will be there in longevity. Um, you know, it's very, I mean, there's double packaging across this industry all the time. Removing double packaging is, is sustainable in itself and it's lower cost because you're not buying two pieces of packaging. Like that's, that's where the industry should go. The um, another thing that you told me about that you were working on at, when you know, we had a different conversation about innovation was, you know, similar packaging across multiple lines. Mm. And that seems another innovative way to kind of save on costs. Tell us what you're doing. Yeah. So um, so CMG is, is working with a number of distributors around the country to launch brands, both for ourselves and for uh, and for other brands across the market. Um, one of the early realizations that we had was you know, obviously everyone came out fully guns loaded on, on the jars and, and there's only so many applications to the jars. And then we switched to pouches. Now, if you look at pouches, um, there's a lot more products you can actually put in a pouch. And if I can actually increase my volume units and have ubiquitous packaging across a number of different lines, saves me on cost when I do big packaging runs. It also saves in complexity and allows me to move my labor around to different product classes as opposed to groups being, you know, they can make vapes only, they can make topicals only, they can make hash only. If all of it is streamlined, that I'm moving them around my facility a lot more efficiently, labor is a massive cost savings in this industry. And again, any ability to get incremental price savings on volume, volume orders packaging um, is beneficial. That's great, okay. Uh, we've got another, another comment here. Uh, this is from Tarek. Uh, sustainable packaging in the cannabis space. Check out Truly Green Plastic. Um, so do you know about this company, the Truly Green Plastic? Well, yeah, I, I'm not uh, personally uh, aware with them, though I think in the last two months we've talked to five or six different organizations who's very focused on sustainable packaging. So it's good to see more, more groups coming up. I mean, I know the U.S. is certainly a lot further ahead when it comes to hemp 
packaging. My uh, my agency and, and my marketing team uh, are very focused and have a very um, uh, keen eye on finding the kind of uh, the sources of materials that you know aren't just for you know what can be done cheaply. It's about what can be done um, sustainably for the future. And if again more groups are pushing into these types of formats collectively. That's where also the manufacturer is going to benefit from. Uh, it's hard being a manufacturer in the sustainable world and kind of only having one or two clients to, to live and die from. Um, if you can push 10 organizations together collectively and that becomes a switchover, then um, it's a lot easier. And that's, I think, another benefit of, of what CMG does is we represent, you know, 20 or so guild members who represent 150 different clients. If we can push a handful of them together in one direction, um, it's a much easier ability to switch because you can look at one another. At least they're going in it together. The uh, the challenge I see. Let's let's say you on your your packaging that's across all the lines, and let's say you're doing that for ten companies. Then there needs to be something that's differentiating. And I'd love to talk to Melissa next time about you know how you can set a brand apart through the labeling, you know, through your brand positioning when you have the same package. Because I know that's been a problem with with Canadian packaging over the past year is it all looked the same on the outside. And that's where, you know, we at Tread were trying to do or have done numerous containers that were different shaped. So, you know, there's a bit of a challenge there to get ubiquitous yet stand out as a brand. Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting market in cannabis because I know in our last conversation, you know, I, I look at cannabis packaging almost like beauty packaging, right? But at the same time, the regulations are more similar to alcohol. Um, you know, no one complained that everything's in a, in a beer can, right? I mean, it's the same ubiquitous packaging. Now you can make minor tweaks. Now, obviously Canada has not allowed for a lot of leniency to make, you know, a pouch look really cool because I have a fixed amount of space I can put a logo, I have a fixed amount of information I can put on. I can't use more than six colors on anything. Um, so you really are, are your, your hands are tied in that method. Um, but it also goes back to the, the buyers. I mean, you know, realistically, um, you know, they're the end consumer who has to deal with all the logistics of shipping and master pack and crating. They want some uniformity as well. So I know it, it from a consumer level, it looks silly where, you know, 100 brands are all using pouches and jars and, you know, there's not a lot of differentiation. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's not very different from other industries. And I think there is marginal ways to, to play in that. And again, we're an industry that's very reliant on word of mouth and bud tenders. I think more of the marketing tools will be used at that retail level as opposed to what does the packaging look like. And I think you can look across the industry. Most people just use beauty packaging on their websites and it doesn't actually look the same it would in real life. Well, yeah, you're really selling the brand in terms of the lifestyle and the product, actually the product, you know, mm. we can't forget about a quality product. So, you know, in a lot of these posts and conversations that I've had over the past couple of weeks, in some ways, people don't care about the packaging if the product is superior. So. That, that's that's a, a big thing that CMG focuses on as well. I mean, we play in white space categories. Um, we don't like to fall. I mean, if you look in pre-rolls and flour, it's a knife fight for 5% of market share across any brand. So um, there's a lot of untapped categories. There's a lot of stuff that's going to come from the U.S. and finally get to Canada. Um, that's where we can be a little more tactful and, and launch new formats. But again, I think the Canadian industry has spoke very, very loudly. Quality is the most important thing at the end of the day. People will trade up for quality, um, but I don't think that translates from a packaging standpoint as much as other um, consumer packaged goods you know, categories may do with beauty. Well, especially now when you have a secondary package and people just throw it away right when they open it up anyway. So it's right. kind of like, you know, are you using the package to sell or is it perceived luxury or higher price? You know, uh, the elimination of that is what's important too, you know, not just the sustainable package, but to eliminate packaging. I'm going to show a comment here by Brad, who was in the conversation the other day, and he brings up a good point that, you know, part of sustainability is just eliminating something through innovation. Mm -hmm. And really that, that thanks Brad for that comment. That brings up uh, another point that I wanted to ask you about is, um, you know, we've been talking about some ways to kind of revolutionize can lids. And can you talk a little bit about what you're doing to innovate in that area? Yeah. So, I mean, we looked at can lids with you and kind of knowing that the beverage industry was, was 
probably on the up in Canada. I know there's been a, a number of false starts so far, but you know our original um, idea was you know use plastic similar to, to other things that are currently in the market. I mean, you look at any canned beverage, there's a CR top, um, but that's an extra piece to add. Um, you brought up the good idea of well, why can't we use tin or why can't we use aluminum similar to what the cans already built them? That was a great idea. We said, okay, what's the cost of that? So as long as the costs match up. And again, you're walking into uh, an LP or a, or a purchasing agent saying, you know, there's no cost differentiation. There's no time waste on changing over your equipment or, or you know, these big barriers to entry. If you can get into the market at the same price with a more novel idea, it should be a no brainer for you guys to switch over. But still, um, sometimes, you know, some of these big manufacturers will continue to push you on price and want to see price reductions at the end of the day. Um, Again, we're in a market where there's a lot of people being pulled in various different directions. And unfortunately, when there's 20 different problems on your, your list of to-dos, um, sustainability can fall quite low on that. So uh, again, it takes groups like us to give them a little extra nudge, but oftentimes it also takes some leaders in the market to show it can be done. And then for larger companies to adopt it and, and make it kind of more mainstream. So we have that kind of mindset. And you know, that's why I continue to think that most of the products that will come out with our brand names on them, we want them to be novel, we want them to be different, we want them to be something the industry hasn't seen before, because that will garner attention. And if it can have those sustainability elements to it, then that's a marketing tool. And then you can be successful pushing that narrative a, a little more nationally or even internationally. So you think it'll be a challenge to lead with sustainability, but if you lead by solving, let's say the top five problems that LPs are having now, and by the way, this is a sustainable option, you can use that not only for cost savings, for branding, for PR, for corporate social responsibility, oh, yeah. and it's really a no brainer in there. So question is, what do you think are the top three problems that are gonna be, you know, that LPs are, are working on here in the next year that you can help with and then bring sustainability into that? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, it's the optimization of their current square footage. So, um, you know, problems that arise are, well, let's just take a, a normal jar packaging. If I were to put out 100,000 units of product in a month, just the storage capacity I need to put those products out, and especially once you put um, flour in them, now you need secured storage space for them. So, you know, reducing the package size itself is both sustainable and a cost saving exercise and a storage saving exercise. So those are a multi bundled solution that do a number of different things. Now, if a group has the ability to communicate all of those benefits, then likely you're in a better position to actually make the sale. So certainly um, optimization of space. Um, innovation is the other problem. You know, again, there's a lot of companies who they'll choose one product for the year and that's what they're going all into because they don't, they don't have the bandwidth for it. Mm -hmm. So with the emergence of a lot more CMOs in this space, um, you do have the ability to showcase new and different products and then sell them off to the highest bidder who's willing to launch it. But again, you need to offer a solution where, you know, similar to what we're doing with our gummies, CMG is running out ahead with the first products, you know, into market. And the reason we're doing that is so we can show the rest of the community that, look, this is launchable. It's done. It's been done. So if you don't follow suit, you're just going to be left behind. Now mm -hmm. it becomes, you know, what position are some of these companies in? If they're losing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, you're in a much different boat to be able to innovate and do these different things. So I see a lot more of the new incumbents actually being on the next wave of innovation. And then I'm sure the giants will see that and then they'll probably adopt it for themselves. So those would be the two kind of big ones that, that I see. So where where is the innovation coming from in Canada? Is it from where you are, is it more West Coast? Where do you see it? Smaller firms, larger design? What do you? What's your opinion on that? Um, I would say, I would say it's it's across the board. I mean, I've I've seen some really good products coming out of the East Coast, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. They're certainly getting on the radar more. BC has always been, you know, a, a big cannabis mecca. But Ontario has a lot of money to do a lot of different things, uh, and that's certainly where you know the big LPs are residing, and, and they're pushing their initiatives as well. So. I don't, you know, I don't think there's any individual area. What I do think is that 
it's the small new entrants. It's the it's the teams of two or three who are focused on technology or the science or something differentiated, and them finding a partner and potentially them coming to CMG and saying, hey, look, we have this amazing new product. We need more people to see it. We need more intros to the large LPs. And if we can bring them in and show them, look, this is a part of your portfolio that is both synergistic to what you're currently designing. It's not going to add a bunch of difficulty and costing. You know, hopefully there's already a product in market so you know it's actually penetrated somewhere. If you can do all those together, um, then you're going to have a lot more longevity. But we also need to be understanding, you know, the capital markets are a lot tighter than they used to be. There's not hundreds of millions of dollars just being washed around for, for people to kind of take on big projects. This is much more of a let's have fundamental businesses again. Let's make profits before we go into the next wave of you know, rolling the dice in Vegas kind of thing. The, uh, I had a comment here from Alex. Thanks. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, James got some kudos there, you know, and, and I, I think we can wrap it up now. I wanted to let everyone know that you can contact James. Uh, you can direct message him, connect in with LinkedIn. Uh, you want to do your, uh, talk about your website and your email, how people can get a hold of you? Yeah, I mean, you can send me an email at info at cannabismanufacturersguild.com, our website, www.cannabismanufacturersguild.com. Um, you know, feel free to hit any of our team up on LinkedIn. We try to be very uh, vocal. Um, you know, we don't mind getting uh, inbounds from the LinkedIn community. And again, we're here to solve problems. So if you're looking to launch a brand, if you're looking to, you know, get some products to market, um, you know, we're your, we're your team to help. So uh, certainly open to collaborate with more in the industry. And, uh, you know, thank you again to all of our guild members. Um, you know, we built a, an incredible platform to launch the next wave of products. And there's a lot of individual LPs I could give shout outs to, but um, it's a pretty longer list. Um, but uh, I'm looking forward to obviously, you know, 2021 and, you know, good luck to everybody during this COVID times. It's, uh, it's difficult to do business and, um, you know, we're here to help. So if anything you guys need from CMG, we're around. Great. Okay. Sounds good. You know, I created a, a group, a LinkedIn group here. It's a sustainability group. So if any of you are interested, join that group. We're going to be having more discussions as well as more live conversations uh, just to keep this going. You know, I think it will come from small kind of startup and a lot of people who are concerned uh, about packaging waste. I know there are solutions and I know you're a part of it. So thanks for being on the show. Appreciate your time and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye. Yeah.